lost both teams. Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's boring. Green light the asset. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in Bourne. He has to be put down. He will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get the ticket. We enforce it. And at the end of the day, each and every man to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. And I'm your host, Dave Bourne. It is January 19th, 2017, and we are coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on the Nonpartisan Liberty for All media and radio network, which now runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can listen to the live stream on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com. And to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty For All, we promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom. Exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. We are, of course, always happy to hear from you, even if you have something bad to say. And you can reach us via phone at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. Or you can reach us via Skype. Our username is Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And just send us a contact request and a message with your name and what you want to talk about. And, of course, you can check us out at our official website, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, which has links to our Facebook pages and other social media, as well as various original articles and blogs and other things as well. And if you forget the number or uh, username for Skype, you can find that all there also uh, our email address if you want to send us an email all at nonpartisan liberty for all dot com so today and I apologize for missing yesterday I know it's been the past uh, couple I think like the past couple months it's just been off and on kind of I took a couple weeks off for a holiday And then just between work and just being tired and um, not having the time to prepare for a show, Um, you know, I've missed some shows here and there. And ideally, I want to do a show, make sure that we have Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, a live original show. And if I can't do that, I can always record a show on the weekend and then have its first airing uh, one of those days, which I thought about possibly doing that. But I just need to put more time into the show during the uh, time I have off. So, you know, Mondays and Fridays and, of course, weekends. What I've been talking about for a while that hopefully I will finally do this weekend or at least record, record it this weekend. I don't know if I'll post it this weekend is start to put up some YouTube videos. I think that will help the radio show a lot. 
And it's also something that I want to do. I, I don't call it a uh, media and radio network. I kind of came up with that name because I want to do various things within media. And I mean, I've talked about how my bachelor's degree is in film. Um, I also used to rap. So that's how I know a little about the technology side, I guess. Although, you know, I used a four track, <laughs> which was a four track for people who don't know what it is. It's kind of like if you have a mixing board, say, take your first four uh, buses or your first four, whatever you want to call them. I know there's different names for them. And they had those on there, but it would use a tape and it would use both sides of the tape. So it would split it. So on one side, you have two tracks and using the other side, you have two tracks. That's how you would get four tracks. So if you tried to play it in like a regular recorder or a regular tape player, it would uh, play two of the tracks normally and then pay the other two backwards. So, of course, you'd use that and then uh, record it to a tape or uh, burn it to a CD or whatever. But I used to, you know, hook up a microphone to that and adjust the levels. And mine wasn't that. Uh, I actually still have it. I tried to sell it. I tried to pawn it to see if because it was kind of old I could get anything for it and it it wasn't that different from my mixer although my mixer is a lot more expensive and has a lot more um knobs to uh a lot more ways to improve and affect the sound where it I mean it had bass and treble and things like that but it didn't have as much to, you know, equalize the sound on my mixer. I even have compression. So I didn't want to go into a long thing on that, but that's how I was kind of familiar with that. But anyway, I also wanted to write articles, which I haven't in a while, but I do have a lot of articles. So if you haven't been to nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, go and check out the articles, comment on them. If you think they suck, you know, give me some constructive criticism. And, you know, saying that this sucks really doesn't do anything. It doesn't prove your point. It doesn't um, make an argument. If you have an argument to whether it's on my writing style and a lot of them it is more blog type uh, articles where I'm just giving my opinion. That's why I call them kind of articles slash blogs. But to give whether it's on my show and I know there's a lot of issues that I can improve on on my show. And I've analyzed myself before. And unfortunately, I've gotten away from that because for a while there, I just all I wanted to do was improve on my show. But it's you get caught up in life and all the other things that are going on. And it's hard this not being my full-time job. If this was what I did full-time, I think not only the radio show, but YouTube videos and articles that there would be, um, greatly improve from what I've done so far. And I haven't done YouTube videos yet, but the articles in the show, but it would just be more researched, be more intelligent, give more information. I think it'd even be more entertaining because I would work on that. I'd work on, you know, everything I possibly can. Now, Part of radio, and I've always said this, though, is no matter how much you study or practice, well, not practice, but um, study or prepare, there's nothing that can prepare you to do radio as far as being able to be great at it. Like, no matter how talented you are, and how prepared you are the first time you do a show, it's probably not going to be that good. 
it could be okay, but I think with radio, in my opinion, that no matter how talented and you are, that to get to being great, you have to just do shows. That it's you have to have that on the job training. You know what I mean? You have to actually do shows to get better. And I guess that would be probably with everything, but I think it's a lot different with radio compared to other things. But, you know, or maybe it's because a lot of people think that radio is really easy, that anybody can do an internet show, and anybody can do an internet show, but not anybody can do a good internet show. And I've had my fair share of terrible ones even recently. Even the one I did Tuesday, I didn't think was that that great, because I, you need to entertain. I guess it depends what your your goal is. No matter what, you need to be entertaining. Um, if your show is an entertainment show, then I mean that's your main goal. But even if it's something like my show where I'm trying to educate people. I'm trying to promote certain ideas and get the word out about certain things. At the same time, I got to entertain people because if it's boring, they're just going to turn it off. So the same thing with an article or a video or whatever. I'm going to do a show about this at some point, and I kind of talked about it a little in the past, but not like I'm going to. Because I started watching some of these people on YouTube, the quote unquote celebrity YouTubers, just like you have the celebritarians. I mean, these people are getting between, you know, 200,000 and 500,000 uh, views per video. Now, their videos are usually five to 10 minutes long. And they are relatively good some of them but it's not like they're super talented or anything it depends on the person some are better than others and some the quality is better than are better than others and it depends and there there's people that have been doing it for a while and have gotten a lot better but some of these people have just come out of nowhere and they're instantly getting all these views and i You know, I'm like, how the fuck? I just don't get it. And one of the things that I wish they would do is instead of because what they're doing is a lot of the same stories that are on government media and you have both sides of it and they kind of go at each other. And it's like the most popular ones are, you know, millennials, people probably in their early 20s and they attack other YouTubers that are on the other side and it's just the whole thing but it'd be an interesting show so it's something I'm going to talk about because the main relationship I guess to what I'm trying to do is that they don't tend to cover a lot of issues that I think are important. A lot of it is race. And they've all gotten sucked in to the whole racial divide, I guess, that to me was created by the mainstream media now, or government media and the government, you know, of course, instructing them. But I'm not saying that there's not issues and that racism doesn't exist it's just what they did and how they manipulated it to make it into something that is totally not you have a lot of uh these millennial millennials that are doing videos they're doing all those things that government media kind of wants people to do to distract them from all these other stuff like whether it's 
you know, on one side, they attack the feminists and then the feminists are promoting the feminism. And then on one side, it might be, you know, the Black Lives Matter and the other side, it, it, shit like that. So there, and I understand what they're doing. It's not like they're covering things that are pointless and a lot of them are, you know, talented. I just, I don't watch a lot of short videos because usually when I listen to YouTube, I don't usually watch it is when I'm at work and I'm working on stuff and I need something to listen to. So I can't sit there and change it every second. And I've talked about this. So I look for something that's at least like an hour long that I can listen to and then I won't have to change it for a while. Um, Sometimes it automatically, I know, like will go to another video, but it might not be something that I want to listen to. And some people set up playlists Uh, for those people. I guess you can just play all their material or whatever, but but I'm not really into the short videos. I, I I look through those um to find videos to play on the show usually because obviously I'm not going to play an hour video <laughs> on my show. I look for stuff that's a lot shorter. Anyway, um today we're going to be talking about a few different things that are all interrelated that relate to pre-crime. Um really what I wanted to cover and what I was thinking about mainly was thought crime. And then I started thinking about the hate speech and then how thought crime is really pre-crime anyway. And all those things are essentially related together. And a lot of it is coming from social media, Um, social media being the biggest uh, thing where people post their thoughts and people forget. And I I don't know how you can forget this and how people aren't mad. I mean, I don't want people to be mad all the time over stuff like you're sitting there you know, mad every minute because the government's spying on you. But people, I don't want to ever say, because I do this sometimes and then I correct myself, like what people need to do. I was sorry, checking my mic. It sounds a little different to me. But I don't tell people like what they need to do. But I wish people would be more aware of this if they're not and bring it up more. I mean, fuck, we are being spied on 24-7. All your data is being collected, whether they're doing something with it or not. And something you're doing may be a thought crime in the future. Not to mention that they can use this information to create a profile on you. And there's so many things that they can do with this information that people don't even think about. And it's it's kind of sad. I mean, this is a huge thing. And a lot of people had already thought this. I mean, I had already thought the government's, you know, spying on us and whatnot. But we didn't have any concrete solid information people would just say oh you're just crazy it was a conspiracy theory it's funny how things are conspiracy theories and then they come out as oh whoops it wasn't a conspiracy theory so that happens it seems to happen a lot i don't know my voice doesn't sound i don't know if something's up with my mic or what, but it's like it doesn't sound as deep as it usually does. I don't know. Anyway, so I wish people would always keep that in mind, especially when you're posting stuff and you're putting stuff out there. And I'm not saying be afraid. I'm fuck them. I mean, I I post what I want, but I I realize 
that the government's watching. So I don't really post anything personal because essentially what you're doing is you're just giving them a map of your life. If you're on Facebook posting all this stuff about yourself, where you're going, what you're eating for dinner, fucking where you're shopping at, all of these things, they're, of course, going to know all that stuff. And it, there's going to be a file on you like there is everybody else in a database that's probably linked by your Social Security number that pulls data from all these other databases. And there's a whole big profile on you. And do they look at everybody's profile? Of course not. They, it, it would be impossible. But they have algorithms running that would most likely flag certain things. And I'm sure they're very complicated because you can't be flagging too much. Plus, you have a certain amount of people like, what are they doing? For example, I always talk about they have a fusion center in Las Vegas and they have two in Nevada. For those who don't know what fusion centers are, they are those uh, I don't know what you'd call them, organizations. I mean, it's the police, the DHS, and the FBI all on a task force for what else? Terrorism. So they're all on a terrorist task force fucking doing what all day who knows i mean if you saw the movie snowden which this is true they can do that this they had um you know open somebody's camera on their computer some girl and they were looking at her she was in a burqa and she was taking it off now whether that really happened i don't know or not but i'm sure that something similar to that probably happened but they're capable of doing that so what are these fuckers doing all day Probably not much. You have 70 of them, I believe, around the country. So they can do whatever the fuck they want. They have access to this data. And yours might get flagged. Um, They also get calls. I had talked about somebody who was visited by the fusion center for a post they made on Facebook about cops. Now the fusion center people claim that I think there's another word for it too, besides fusion center, but they claim that they were tipped off that somebody had, had called them whether that's true or not. I don't know. And this person used to co-host my show, and my show actually came up as well. At least that's what they said to me. Not the Fusion Center, the person who was questioned. Dude was questioned. So what you're posting or conversations you're having, they're all being stored. And... I remember asking my friend's daughter, I think at the time, she was in high school. She might have been 18. She might have been first year of college or something. And her and a boyfriend, like, you know, what they think of it. And they're like, well, if you're not doing anything, you know, and the whole thing, well, what am I going to do about it anyway? And. I said, okay, well, if all these people are seeing your stuff, let me see your phone. And she's like, no. I'm like, well, they can read all your texts, but you won't let me read your texts? Because basically, that's what's going on. So I keep looking at my mixer to see if the fucking cat stepped on something because <laughs> it sounds like something's off. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. And turn up, turn up the bass or something. I don't know. I'll have to listen to it later and see. Hopefully, everything's coming through good. So, I wanted to talk about these different things. 
not only as a warning to people, but to get people to think about what their thoughts are on some of this stuff. And there was a documentary I had seen it before and I thought maybe I did a show about it, but I looked and I didn't about, they called him the cannibal cop. So he was a cop, I believe in New York. Wasn't it in New York? Yeah, I believe it was in New York. And he was the guy, a lot of people might remember that had conversations on this this dark fetish website i think was the name of the website it was a dark fetish something something like that they showed it in the documentary no i don't go there and and i don't you know if people do i don't i don't judge anybody that's the whole thing about freedom is you know you have the freedom as long as you don't directly affect my freedom and attack me or my family or whatever or anybody else you can you do your thing whatever you want and I might not agree with it personally or want to live my life like that but I'm not going to try to stop you from doing it via the government that's your choice to do so he would go on this website and talk about real scenarios of eating people and he would actually even talk about his wife like cooking them and eating them and killing them and all of these things but he never did it and he never did a lot of the things that he said he was going to do like he said that he was going to build something or he had built uh some thingy uh it was something to hold people in or something some pulley apparatus thing so like he said that he had built that he never built it he said he's he's gonna buy a house in the woods somewhere i have the location picked out he never did that he never would give last names of people because there was a number of girls that he knew and that's who we talk about he would give their first name never give their last name and their address. And they showed um, the texts back and forth or the messages back and forth. And they would ask for addresses and stuff like that because I don't know that these other people, uh, even though the two, two people that he talked to, one of them was never prosecuted on anything and another one was prosecuted for something totally unrelated in England because he was from England. So I don't know if most of the people on there were like that, too, that it was some fucking sick fantasy. And you think of like people that make horror movies and what must be in their minds and some of these sick ass fucking movies and shit like Hostel or um, I, I don't know. There's there's a lot of them that are weird and perverse and 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 things like that so obviously they have these ideas in their mind now this guy specifically talked about his wife and girls he used to date and he used the police computer to actually find out where they were but you can also say that people google or I hate saying Google people use the internet to try to find old girlfriends or um, people they used to date all the time. They just don't have access to, you know, a police computer. The one thing though, and when I first heard this, I was like, yeah, look, a fucking cop. And of course I posted the article like as a, Another thing about, you know, oh, look at this fucking cop, you know, look at look at what cops are doing, you know, to add to. And it wasn't just the one guy. It was just to add to all the incidences that come up of cops doing fucked up things. But I didn't you know, I read the article, but 
I didn't get into all the detailed information about it. I got some of it. And then I watched the documentary and that had got into all the detail of what happened. And this, this comes out totally to a pre-crime or a thought crime issue because he never did anything about it. So he didn't even prepare. He didn't buy anything that he would use to do it. He didn't um, like do actual things that somebody would do to get ready for it. it they tried to use this one thing. I believe in um, he visited a uh, ex-girlfriend in Maryland and he bar- brought his wife and his daughter and they tried to make that out to be because this is one of the girls he talked about that that was him, you know, scoping out where she lived or something or the situation or whatnot. But nothing came out of it and he just talked about it. And when he looked her up and looked up her address, like they were saying how dates didn't correspond. It wasn't like um, somebody that was going to actually follow through with something would follow through a pattern that they would look them up. Then they would, you know, maybe scope them out. Then they would go and buy whatever tools they need, you know. He didn't do any of that. And actually what's what's kind of fucked up is it was his wife that went to the police and he had closed his account. She put some spyware on there because she didn't know what he was doing on the computer. He started staying up late. So he had said in the documentary that he wasn't going to do this anymore because it was affecting his life and his family. And he had told himself once it affects my life and my family, it's, it's kind of like an addiction to anything. I mean, you can look at it like drugs, like once it affects your life like that, then, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it anymore. And so he closed his accounts and he was done with it. And that's the, like the day before she found out or something. So, She went to the police because you think about it. You got a cop going around who's talking about some crazy shit online. And it was very detailed. It was actual people. And he did say a couple of times that he's not serious. But then sometimes he said that he was. And. I think that was all part of the game, you know, to make sure to say, yeah, I'm not serious, but I want to act like I am that. Yeah, I would do this. And really what this comes out to and what the importance of this whole thing is is not him and what he actually did. It's the ramifications of something like this, which no one really focused on. Um, They were more, because of course, government media, they were more focused on, well, look, it's a crazy fucking guy that wants to eat people. It's another Jeffrey Dahmer. We We just got him before he was going to do it. And of course the fact that he was a cop, but they didn't focus too much on that because of course in the eyes of government media, mostly cops are good. This whole thing that they try to say that the media demonized cops, they did not demonize (laughs) media has never government media, at least has never really demonized cops. They, they they barely even talk about the murders that cops committed. And I'm talking about all the people, not just a selective few that fit uh, the narrative that they're trying to uh, 
put across uh, push across to the people. And I get a, I will do a show about this as well. And I've talked about it a little because look after government media, Black Lives Matter, and then the other pe- people on the other side the, the, that were anti-Black Lives Matter. Look what they did as far as people's opinion of police. They actually somehow police got out of this whole thing essentially probably better off than they were before somehow, which is ridiculous. It really is because they did fucked up shit and people still don't know that they're killing. I got to check the statistics for 2016, but at least 1400 people a year. And that's, what we know about and there I'm sure there's a lot that they kill that they bury the fucking bodies and how many they do that to who fuck who the fuck knows if they kill somebody that they think no one's going to be looking for like a homeless person and no one finds out not like you know the one they beat to death that people got on video but if they got somebody and nobody's seen it now i know it's a lot harder because most towns have cameras and stuff but they've killed people on camera and got away with it so it's 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 insane the shit that they get away with that the media don't we don't even talk about it but but they ended off they ended up better off almost than before um, Black Lives Matter and the anti-Black Lives Matter, because I blame them just as much because they fed off of each other like Democrats and Republicans to just create a whole fucking bullshit, like wrestling match kind of thing with a bunch of propaganda so we'll talk about that uh, another day. But so this whole cannibal cop and him, you know, despite him talking about killing and eating people and talking about real people, and disgusting fucking shit. He was only talking. There's nothing that he did to even move in any direction of it being real. So what happened was, from what I understood... And the documentary was made in 2015. But at the end of the documentary, I thought that he had, um, maybe he never went back to trial. Because what happened in the first trial, the jury found him guilty, but the judge overturned it. And then the government... Uh, came back at him for a retrial and he was on house arrest. And then I just assumed at the end of the documentary that he got off in the retrial, but they actually didn't say that. So I'm not sure if they've had the retrial yet. Either way, You have a jury that found him guilty. And the fact that the judge overturned it is surprising. Because usually they just want to convict people. And maybe it was because he was a cop. Um, Maybe it was you happen to find one of the, the few fucking judges who actually believes in some sort of freedom some level of fucking freedom. But 
usually juries, they, you know, they just follow the instructions of the judges and the juries are pretty much rigged because whatever the judges tell them on how they should look at the case, that's what they base it off of. And I mean that in the sense of, well, if you believe he did this, then you should find him guilty. Or if you believe, you know, it's shit like that. It's just, it really shows how judges influence cases. And they really do. They're part of the government. They're on the side of the government. At least 99% of them. Now, again, in this case, it's fucking surprising. Um... I don't know what happened again. Occasionally, I guess you'll get somebody that will uh, follow the law or actually believe in a principle or, or whatever. But I mean, that in itself is fucked up that your freedom depends on the fucking judge you get. I mean, the whole system is fucked. That whole, if if the next person I hear that says we have the greatest justice system in the world, I'm going to punch them in the face. I'm not actually going to do that. But what if, you know, thought crime, you know, that that was a crime, that's a threat. It's not a threat against a specific person, but... You can see where things are going. And this isn't an issue that I've spent a lot of time on because, I I mean, I have talked about it. And I've definitely talked a lot about spying. And I try to talk about it every so often just to fucking remind people that your data is being collected. Your whole life is on file with the government, especially if you were born in like the past 10 years. Because kids that are born today and have been maybe even longer, they get it like right when they're born. I mean, the hospital takes all this data. They want to create social security cards at the hospital. And they do if you uh, do that. And then what they did was they passed a fucking law that says that you cannot claim your kid unless you get them a social security card. So most people, the greedy fucks that they are, and I don't know that I call them greedy because they want that money back. I mean, it's extortion money. It's money that nobody should be paying anyway. So I don't call, I don't think they're greedy in that sense. I mean, I don't think I should be be paying any taxes. That's my money that should go to me. And I don't think I'm greedy for saying that. I don't think anybody's greedy for saying that. I'm saying they're greedy in a sense that they'd rather like sell out their kid because that's kind of what they're doing in a sense. They're selling part of their kid's freedom to get money back. Now, it is their money that the government fucking stole from them, and it's really just less money that the government is going to extort from them. So there's nothing wrong with that, but it's the fact that you get a social security card at birth. You're helping the government to track your kid at birth. And you in supposedly they use that as the that's part of the collateral of the debt or whatever and to secure It's like a bond or, I don't know, or your birth certificate is. It's one or the other or both. But either way, it gives them a unique ID, which is very important in tracking people. And they're able to track your kid instantly. And then everything they fucking do we get attached to that social security number and you know i didn't get a social security card so i was like 11 or 12 or something 
And it might have been because of the tax law. That, that law is not that old. I mean, it's something in the past 20 or 30 years. It might not have even been because of that. I, I'd have to ask my mother again. I forget why she told me that she got it when she did. But a baby doesn't need a fucking Social Security card. They don't. And the government knows that. So in order to force people to get their kids Social Security cards, they created that incentive. And that incentive was, hey, you get a Social Security card, you can claim your kid. Now you need one. But anyway, back to this. And and not only that, and I know you don't put in a Social Security number for Facebook, but they're able to figure it out from, you know, most people, not all the time, but they're trying to make computers so essentially they know who the user of the computer is. Now, in like a family, you don't really know 100%, although passwords and logging on the things and the things that you look at and whatever. Um, Or if people have their own computers, but you could be using, you know, your wife's or your kids or whatever. Or you could be at a friend's house using their computer. But for the most part, they've set up computers now where they pretty much know who the user is. Like 99% of the time. Even if you go to the fucking library. So it's hard to anonymously use a computer. Although there's ways to do it. It, There's, of course, ways to do it by downloading certain things. You know, Tor and stuff like that where you can anonymously browse and, and, and do all that. But, I mean, if you're just using a computer and not using any of that stuff... It usually they know who the user is, which is kind of fucked up when you think about it. Of course, every computer has a unique IP. Now, if you have IP cloaking and stuff, that helps. But that's what I mean. And you, you, there's stuff you can get to help block that. But when assuming that you have a kid that ends up going to government school and now they want, you know, nursery school, either mandatory or free or both. And then, you know, you have kids in school at three, you take them away from their parents at three because you want to get a hold of them and start the propaganda, the younger, the better. And you want to start putting all the info in the database. The ramifications of all of this shit and what things are going to look like 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. You cannot fathom. I I cannot fathom what they're going to, because it's, it's going to be so fucked up. I mean, the things that they'll be able to do, it's like, how are they going to do it? Or, and when I say how, I don't mean how, like they're going to have all the information, but how are they going to choose to set things up? You know, whether it's based on all the data they collect, they assign jobs to people or based on a need and along with, you know, analyzing people or they have people killed based on their profile because they believe that when they get older, they're going to be a criminal or they have a profile of somebody that won't kill anybody, but it's dangerous. So they're going to put them in some kind of camp. There's so many things that most people just say, well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's not, but Look at what's happened to this point. Everything that's happened to this point, people have said, 
That's not going to happen. I I guarantee you people said, because people said it at the time, oh, the government can't be spying on you and taking all your data and listening to your phone calls and your text messages and all that shit. They wouldn't do that. They're the government. They're there to protect your freedoms. That's what they tell you. No, that's not why they're there. They are there to take over and control as much as possible money and power and control. Well, I'm going to take a quick break to play some clips as well as one about the cannibal cop. And when we come back, we'll talk more about thought crime and pre-crime and also hate speech and how hate speech, I think, is going to be the first thing that they really go after. And I mean that in a pass laws against it type of uh, thing where they're kind of doing that in a way already with hate crimes where hate crimes are like pre-crimes because at least part of it is because you committed a crime, but now you're trying to, or thought crimes because you're trying to determine the motivation. So we'll talk about those and more when we get back again, if you'd like to join the conversation, 702-470-7664, that's 702-470-7664, or username Nonpartisan Liberty for All on Skype, and we will be back after this, and check us out on Nonpartisan Liberty for All on on our website. <laughs> I was like, I needed to um, do something real quick because I didn't add these to my uh, my list here. So, or did I do it? Or No, I didn't. So I had to uh, make that go longer. So, yes, check us out at our website at Nonpartisan Liberty for All, and we will be right back after these clips and remember that i i don't play commercials these are all clips that relate um usually to either freedom in general or specifically to the topic that i'm discussing usually it's specifically to the topic we're discussing so it is important to listen to the clips so we'll be back after these uh, clips nonpartisan liberty for all dot com Should you be sent to prison for your fantasies? One could argue that a jury thought so. It found a former New York police officer guilty of conspiring to kidnap and eat women in 2013. Gilberto Vallee became known as the cannibal cop. His twisted thoughts typed in web chats, seen as possible threats. Would this man actually go through with kidnapping a woman, tying her up by her feet, and roasting her? Wait, they said eating women? I don't don't want to be disgusting, so I'll shut up. Because there's, you can take that a couple different ways. So, I'll shut up now and go back to the clip. Over a fire? This is something that was private, anonymous. It was a, you know, a little bit of a skeleton in my closet. And now here, everything, this massive skeleton is out. It's the epitome of embarrassment to sit in that trial and have all these emails and chats read. I mean, it was like, hey, did I, how the hell did I come up with something like that it was it was it was bad that's from hbo's new documentary thought crimes the case of the cannibal cop which premieres tonight on hbo at 9 p.m eastern joining me now is aaron lee carr the director aaron great to see you so the big question for the jury here was conspiracy do you think that he was actually conspiring an evil act his comments were all online Was there any evidence of him actually planning to do any of this? 
So, uh, so basically, it's a it's a complicated uh, complicated question and complicated answer. Um, Gil Valley did not make any did not physically stalk any of the women that he fantasized about. Um, but you know, he did go down to Maryland to visit socially with one of the women that he was fantasizing about. And so that really that that to the jury what was what was considered an overt act. Um, but I, I think that the I think the, the the verdict was thrown out because there just wasn't enough evidence. You made dozens of trips to his home. Were you ever afraid for yourself? I mean, I, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't really afraid. I think the scarier part was going into prison. I was in a federal prison that I visited with his family members. I think that was a lot sort of more scary than uh, visiting an apartment in Queens. Uh, but you know, it's a dangerous. Uh, it's a dangerous topic, and he's thinking about these things about young women. So. Uh, you know, it, it was it was challenging. And his wife is the one who turned him in, right? Do they have any contact anymore? They do not have any contact. Uh, since he was released from prison, they're kind of having custody battles or issues over his daughter. But as far as I know, they do not remain in contact. It wasn't just words. Valley also posted pictures of women, some of them his friends. What does he have to say about that? That makes it seem, in a way, more than just weird fantasy because he's actually talking about specific people. It gets even creepier. Yeah, I think that was one of the scariest elements of the case, that he was using, he was downloading Facebook pictures of his friends and kind of trading it to other uh, men and women on the Internet. Uh, that's what made people so uncomfortable. But, you know, I think that he did not uh, supply their addresses or things like that. And when he would talk with other men about these women, you know, one day it would be for $5,000, the next day it would be for $4,000, and none of the conversations would ever be discussed that they had talked before. Um, but yeah, no, I wouldn't want anybody downloading my Facebook pictures at all. Did, did, uh, do you think he, did he actually fantasize about being a cannibal or was he just trying to shock people? I, it's, it's of my personal opinion that, um, so Vore is a fetish. It's about the, the fetish of cannibalism. And given the uh, obsessive nature of his fantasies and the amount of time he spent on the site, specifically designed to like towards war fetishes, you know that that was one of his fetishes. So you think he was he was interesting? I guess the question is, uh, you know, the line, and that's why you call the t the, the the movie what you call what you call it thought crimes. It, it, there are authors and filmmakers and all sorts of people who like go into the dark recesses of their brains and bring out disgusting things. How are they different than, than what he did? Yeah, I mean, that was a huge discussion. I worked with Andrew Rossi, the, the producer on this film, and uh, it, we always kind of had to expand and say, you know, everyone always brought up to us, you know, Stephen King, uh, you know, can write these terrible things, but he's not being put in jail. So that was an important element to incorporate because... It's not that it nor normalized the chats that, or the fantasies that this young man was having, but it demonstrated that we all have these dark thoughts mm -hmm. inside our heads, and the Internet is the thing that's making it real. Aaron Carr, it's a great film. Congratulations. I know your dad, your late father, David Carr, longtime journalist, would be very, very proud of you. Time Warner, of course, we should point out, is the parent company of both HBO and CNN. What kind of country throws someone in a cage for publicly criticizing the religion of Islam? Saudi Arabia, Iran, Afghanistan under the Taliban. Well, now you can add the United Kingdom to that list because European Parliament candidate and leader of the Liberty GB party, Paul Weston, was arrested by police last weekend for publicly reciting a Winston Churchill quote that was critical of Islam. How dreadful are the curses which Islam lays on its voters? Besides the fanatical frenzy, which is as dangerous in a man as hydrophobia in a dog, there is this fearful, fatalistic apathy. The effects are apparent in many countries. Improvident habits, slovenly systems of agriculture, sluggish methods of commerce and insecurity of property exist wherever the followers of the Prophet Muhammad rule or live. A degraded sensualism deprives this life of its grace and refinement, and the next of its dignity and sanctity. The fact that in Islamic law, every woman must belong to some man as its absolute property, either as a wealth, a, a wife, a child, or a concubine, must delay the final extinction of slavery until the faith of Islam has ceased to be a great power amongst men.
individual Muslims may show splendid qualities, but the influence of the Islamic religion paralyzes the social development of those who follow it. No stronger retrograde force exists in this world than far from it being moribund. Islamism is a militant and proselytizing faith. It is already spread throughout Central Africa, raising fearless warriors at every step. And were it not that Christianity is sheltered in the strong arms of science, the science against which Islam has vainly struggled, the civilization of modern Europe might fall, as fell the civilization of ancient Rome. Now, the main point of that quote is to berate Islam for its appalling treatment of women in some Muslim societies. Not once does it mention anything to do with race, and yet Weston was arrested for committing a racially aggravated crime under Section 4 of the Public Order Act, fingerprinted, DNA sampled, and could face up to two years in prison. Why was he arrested? Well, someone in the crowd took offence to Weston's thought crime and reported him to the authorities. Again, Weston wasn't inciting violence. He made no racist utterance whatsoever. He simply quoted Winston Churchill. So are we to assume that if Winston Churchill, who was British Prime Minister during World War II, spearheaded the defeat of Nazi totalitarianism, was to speak the same words today, that he too would be arrested by the Thought Police? What does that tell you about the state of free speech in the United Kingdom today? We also learned this week that Scorpion's drummer James Kotak was sentenced to a month in jail for making a remark about, quote, non-educated Muslims while travelling through Dubai Airport. While Kotak was punished for his thought crime of, quote, insulting Islam, even in the United Arab Emirates, the punishment is less severe than in the United Kingdom. Oh, and by the way, while criticising Islam is a horrendous hate crime in the eyes of the British justice system, you are free to stage national theatre shows labelled as, quote, hate-filled mockery, which depict Jesus Christ as a homosexual. That's just fine. Imagine if someone attempted to put on a national theatre production depicting the Prophet Muhammad as a paedophile. When Salman Rushdie wrote a work of fiction, The Satanic Verses, which merely talked about Muhammad adding three verses to the Quran, a fatwa was issued against his life, and Muslims marched through the streets of Britain calling for Rushdie's summary execution. Incitement to violence? Well, no, apparently in the UK it's perfectly acceptable to call for someone's murder, but don't you dare quote a historical figure or you'll be thrown in jail. But at least in America you have the First Amendment, right? Well, maybe not for much longer. Labelled a frankly chilling proposition by the editors of the Boston Herald, the Hate Crime Reporting Act of 2014, which will police free speech on the internet, radio and television, has prompted concern among some that strenuous criticism of immigration policy could be characterised as a hate crime. And here's the takeaway. If any of you are offended by the content of this video, then good, be offended. I don't care, because that does not constitute an argument. What offends me is how political correctness has been hijacked and used as a weapon by the establishment in the West to rip huge chunks out of the edifice of freedom of speech and the right to calmly speak one's mind without the threat of a tap on the shoulder from the thought police. No matter what your faith, race or creed, that should not only offend you, it should downright terrify you. Ah, freedom of speech. One of the building blocks of the American way of life. The freedom to say whatever you want. No matter how f***ing and down with the mother f***ing b***. The freedom to say whatever you want. No matter how f***ing... Come on. Hate speech. That term's so hot right now. Do I blame Donald Trump for uh, using hate speech during his campaign? Absolutely. He did. It's a fact. Normalization of hate speech. Of hate speech. Hate speech. Hate speech! Hate speech and freedom of speech, two different things. I don't defend hate speech. Hate speech. Hate speech and provoked assault! Seems everyone's talking about it, but here's the thing. Okay, hate speech? 
doesn't actually exist. I don't believe you. Now, banning hate speech would sound nice on its surface. Nobody really wants to be hateful or deliberately speak in a way that would hatefully hurt somebody's feelings. Most people don't. But if you buy into the concept of hate speech, some questions arise. Like, who gets to decide? What is and isn't hate speech? How much of hate speech is protected under the First Amendment, if any at all? What limitations should there be on speech? Who are the arbiters of this limitation on speech? And where does the idea of hate speech, let's start with this, or political correctness actually come from? Why does it exist? Some will argue against this, but political correctness stems from something called the Frankfurt School. And when you hear someone refer to the Frankfurt School, they're actually talking about a group of scholars who were associated with the Institute for Social Research founded in Frankfurt in 1923. When you hear the term cultural Marxism, this is where it comes from. Political correctness and cultural Marxism are one and the same. But let me read for you something that I think uh, perfectly crystallizes this from uh, Trent Schroyer's Critique of Domination, Part 227. As advanced industrial societies developed, the individual was more integrated into and dependent upon the collectivity and less able to utilize society for active self-expression. So it's important to understand that the idea of political correctness from its inception was designed as a political weapon to silence voices of dissent, which is why the new left in the 1970s often used it and adopted it themselves. And that's why what's politically correct is ever changing. Is it colored people or people of color? I don't know what. Is it gay, queer, or f*** it? No one knows. And this is why political correctness or cultural Marxism, and they are synonymous, lends itself so fashionably to easy labels. Transphobic, homophobic, xenophobic, racist, bigoted, Uncle Tom, white privilege, mansplaining, all of these are slapped on people with politically incorrect opinions in an attempt to silence you. Was there a reverb on my mic? No, that's MTV's Decoded. Oh, no, that makes sense. So what does this mean, more importantly than making society less fun and comedy suck ball? Or vagina, or anything yet to be defined, it creates an inability to criticize Bad ideas, bad ideologies, like Islam, for example, or the current illegal immigration problem, or the welfare state. So hate speech is inextricably tied to political correctness or cultural Marxism, and that creates intellectual conformity or intellectual authoritarianism. And that's where you start to see things like safe spaces or trigger warnings or speakers banned from campus or people with unpopular opinions banned from social media. And I know that can seem trivial, but today's social media outrage can be tomorrow's laws. And as we've seen, hate speech laws and political correctness destroys lives, as we see all across Europe. For example, these British men arrested for offensive anti-Islam comments. These people arrested for saying racist things on a tram. Or our very own friend Tommy Robinson, who is charged with inciting racial hatred uh, with a flag that says, F*** ISIS. Shouldn't other Muslims want to F*** ISIS? Or this singer arrested for racism after doing a cover of Kung Fu fighting at the wrong time because a Chinese passerby happened to hear him outside the bar. Mr. Go right through. I... Oh, And if that's not enough, just read this list of 16 people who are banned from the UK. Now, that's not supposed to happen stateside, but it's often hard to defend freedom of speech because you're often forced to defend people who say horrible things, as you see with high-profile cases here and here and here. Now, I think what they're saying is terrible, but unless they're causing direct harm, of course their speech is protected in the United States. And our founders expressly made that so. My favorite here is from Benjamin Franklin. If all printers were determined not to print anything till they were sure it would offend nobody, there would be very little printed. So what's the end game here with hate speech laws? Well, a couple of things. On that front, we have legal censorship from the government. And that's a problem, but it's not nearly as pervasive as the one we face daily from cultural Marxism in the intimidation, the cultural authoritarianism of intimidating people into self-censorship. Sure, the government may not step in and tell you that you can't say something, but for fear of losing your job, for fear of being ostracized in society, for fear of being exiled as a racist, as a transphobe, or labeled with one of these life-altering names... People are intimidated into silence. At that point, the government's not required, which is the brilliant sleight of hand that you see uh, from the modern left, as seen here by the ACLU, where they will defend legally one's right. I just wanted to bring this up while it's uh, fresh in my mind. The fact that how he was um, saying that... uh, that legally now i forget what i was gonna say so it was fresh in my mind and now i i totally uh forgot 
<laughs> what the fuck I was going to say um, regarding uh, hate speech. So I'll, I'll go back to it later um, when I remember. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's funny because I wanted to break in while it was fresh in my mind and then my mind went blank, uh, making sure that I broke in to uh, bring it up to freedom of speech, but they will hesitate at nothing to destroy someone's life culturally for saying the wrong thing. I know a lot of people don't like to acknowledge the spectrum of left versus right, but at a certain point, you do have to look at this. You do have to look at the First Amendment and say, okay, who am I linking arms with? I get it. Political platforms change, but today. Okay, I I think I know what what I was going to say. The intimidation and the, he mentioned whether it's being an outcast in society or losing your job or that the government doesn't have to do anything because the definition of free speech really just has to do with government. It doesn't have to do with private corporations or private property or anything like that, meaning that If you're at somebody's house and they don't like what you're saying, they can tell you to leave. If you work for a company and they don't like what you say outside of work, they can fire you. For uh, it depends because you could sue them. Um, It depends on exactly what you're saying. But if you're saying something that's outside the norm, then they could probably fire you and get away with it. Plus, they probably wouldn't say that's the reason why they fired you. So that's kind of what the government does in general. In the clip that I played from Brett Vinat, who I actually asked him to come on the show and he never did. Um, I think it's because he, well, he could have just got caught up with other shit and forgot. I always take shit like... I get rejected. (laughs) But anyway, regardless of whether Brett just didn't want to come on the show because he listened to an episode and didn't like it, or he just uh, got caught up with other things and totally forgot because I didn't want to keep bothering him. Um, He did a great YouTube video, which I play uh, the audio now and then. It's called, um, the is it the truth about libertarians or something like that? It has libertarians in the, uh, in the, what do you call it? In the title. And I was thinking I have it like right here somewhere. Anyway, he talked about in that essentially how criminals, this is, this is a, uh, a really short summarization, but it, cause it's like 13 minutes long and you should definitely watch it on YouTube. So, um, hopefully I can find the name, but if you put in Brett Vinat and libertarians and you'll find it, but he does it like he's an ex libertarian. And the, the summary is, is really that what he's saying is that criminals Essentially, in order to legally rob people and legally rule over people, they created the government. That's essentially the premise of his video, and he does it in a great way. So no matter, you know, I I give credit where credit is due. Not that he did anything bad to me. He could have just totally forgot and, you know, got caught up in other things and whatever. Um and I am still friends with him on Facebook, so it's not like he unfriended me or something. So he might have just totally forgot about it. But anyway, he, this video, I think especially for people that don't understand what we're trying to say, uh, people that believe in, in true freedom and believe that you should be able to do whatever you want, as long as you don't interfere with other people's freedoms and even that there shouldn't be a government because they're a bunch of criminals. But one of the things that he brings up 
in it. And one of the points that he makes, which is a great point, and it's true, is that he was able, or not he, but the government was able to convince people, and they do this all the time. They they did it. I was talking about the Boston bombing recently because I saw Patriots Day, and I'll do a whole show on that. But the same way that in Patriots Day they were able to convince the people that they saved them and they were cheering USA after they violated the fuck out of their freedoms, whether you were somebody whose house they went through or whether you just lived in Boston and you couldn't leave your house and it was basically martial law, even though they deny it because they say, well, we recommended. There's the intimidation factor. When the government recommends and they have a whole bunch of uh, military-style police in the streets, that's really not recommending. You don't really have a choice, okay? And I'm sure uh, for anybody that went out, the cops told them to go back in and may have even pulled their guns, all right? And then they cheer them after. It's like Stockholm Syndrome. So one of the points that he brought up was how the government doesn't even have to criticize people like me or like him because the I'm thinking what I want to call them because I hate we're using the word citizens but I guess they would consider themselves citizens so I'll call them citizens but where the citizens of the country will attack you themselves and sometimes even physically They'll want to fucking fight you sometimes. This is how far this shit goes. It's it's unfucking believable when you really think about it. That people get that mad over things. But, you know, criticism of their government. But the government doesn't even really have to attack you because they've brainwashed people into doing it themselves. And that's kind of, it kind of related to what he said. So that's why I wanted to uh, bring that up while it was fresh in my mind, although it went out of my mind for a minute. Um, That's another thing about the show. If I didn't have a full-time job, I wouldn't get up at quarter or six and I'd be more (laughs) mentally aware when I'm doing my show, instead of it being the end of my day and my mind being gone from thinking all day at work where I have a job that, depending on what I'm doing, I have to put a lot of thought into it. So anyway, uh, we'll go back to the clip and then we have one more clip after that. And then we'll get back to talking about uh hate speech and uh, thought crimes and all of that fun stuff. Which side of the political spectrum is always trying to ban speech? Which side of the political spectrum is always trying to create a new acronym for fear of you losing your job? Which side of the political spectrum is always trying to ban people from campus, from universities, from media, from television? And uh, sorry to interrupt again, but just to, to point out, This is kind of where I have my conversations because I don't have guests on the show and kind of I don't have guests on the show, not because I don't want to, although it would be hard for me now to have guests on the show. I've gotten so used to doing the show by myself, but I used to love interviewing people. It was great because I would get so interested and having co-hosts on the show and all that. It makes for a much better show than just listening to my voice. It really does. But so this is my interaction with uh, clips of other people. So to compare, what he was saying is with speech, if you say the wrong thing, people may attack you. Compa- you may get fired from your job. You may get ostracized where nobody wants to hang out with you or be friends with you, especially if you say certain uh, impo- unpolitically correct words. I'm trying to think of the impolit- un- 
whatever politically, <laughs> impolitically, no, it's politically incorrect. That's what it is. I was trying to reverse the words there. So especially, you know, there's a couple I can think of that if you said, although I, I, I got to mention this, even though I hate fucking mentioning his name. So today, as I was fine to, trying to find stuff, you know, long stuff to listen to, but I wanted to listen to things about my show topic. I found and I couldn't even listen to the whole thing because I, I can't stand this motherfucker anymore. I just I I used to feel bad for him and everybody would bad mouth him and whatever. And, and I didn't want to be like one of those people that bad mouths other people and whatever. But I got to a point where I was just like, there's certain people I just can't fucking ignore the shit that they do. But uh, fucking can't well. Um, and for those who don't know him, I don't well, I don't want to give him any promotion. But he he was basically a guy who was a if you want to use definitions of voluntarist that had the balls enough to speak out against the police and even mention violence, you know, to challenge that whole thing about, you know, being able to defend yourself against the police. He actually went even further than that. Um, so, and it's something that needs to be, talked about i think he had conversations that i didn't agree with him on everything he said but i think it was something that needed to be addressed and nobody would address it but he had the balls to come out and address it and then i respected him for that and then uh i had him on the show years ago now in 2014 and he was great on the show and then all of the sudden he becomes a alt-right white supremacist white nationalist and he'd probably say that oh yeah people just call me white supremacist whatever that's bullshit that they're you know they call me racist and whatever maybe he wouldn't say this now um i don't like the word racist being thrown around the way it is because so many people are called racist that are not racist it's thrown around like you know nothing uh, it, you don't it, it's like the bar for being considered a racist is so fucking low that it's just ridiculous i think just being white makes you a racist i mean seriously it, it's it's crazy and i've seen racism um not what i'd call the type of racism that people saw hundreds of years ago or even in the South in the 60s, but I've seen what I would still call racism. Um, and to me, it has to do with hate and whatever. And this guy is a fucking, you know, he's a straight up racist now. I don't know that he was before, uh, but he didn't talk about it. And he's, you know, if anybody knows anything about the alt-right, they're white nationalists. They claim they're not white supremacists. I don't know what their definition of white supremacists are if they're not white supremacists because they do want to, I mean, they don't want to get, they say they don't want to get rid of other people except immigrants, um, but they want to be the ones in control. They say it's their country that they started. So how is that not being a white supremacist? I'm not saying that they are violent and want to kill uh, other races or anything like that, but they want to be the supreme race, the race that's running everything. So to me, that's white supremacy. So he that's basically what he is. Anyway, he had a debate with Adam Kokesh, and I didn't watch the whole thing. And the fact that he could even... Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with Adam debating him, but... It's funny how, at least up until what I saw, you know, Cantwell, like, held back where he doesn't hold back on his show. And maybe later he didn't, but 
you know, Kokesh should have called him out on that shit. He didn't, at least as far as I watched. Now, I didn't watch the whole thing, but, you know, if if that's the way you are, have the balls to be that way. You know, he kind of said some of the stuff, but it was he wasn't as blatant about it. So I guess I give him credit. He did say some of the stuff, but, you know, yeah, he wasn't as as blatant about it as he is on his show. He calls, you know, black people niggas just for no reason. Like, you know, like he loves to do it just for uh, like a shock value or something. But there is no shock value in it. We know who you are and what you are and you're a fucking douchebag. And, you know, I hate even mentioning him. Especially since I used to have respect for him for what he uh, stood up for. But I have none now. He's just a piece of shit. But what I was going to say is, you know, he's somebody who has all these fucked up opinions and says all these things. And it actually helps him that people like him because of it that people donate he wasn't getting half the money he's getting now when he would talk about you know when he was more of a voluntarist now that he's a fucking you know all right um i don't even know what i guess he's an all right conservative kind of like a mix between a conservative and an alt right, you know, white alt right really stands for like white nationalist, fucking white supremacist. At least that's a big part of what they stand for. That they want, not that they want to get rid of other races as far as kill them or eliminate them. They do want to get rid of a lot of immigrants or stop them from coming in. But they want to uh the white race to continue and make sure that white people are only with white people and have a bunch of kids and actually Cantwell did kind of say that in his debate that he cares about his race and whatever but he still kind of said some things where he made himself sound like he's still a libertarian or still a voluntarist and he's not he's full of shit so my my only point that relates to this is that in his case, it actually helped him um, not hurt him. And I think I'm not for all the politically correct shit and all that, but there's a certain level or certain things that it's not about being politically correct That I just think if that's the view you have, you're fucked up that there's um, if you have the same view as him or uh, red, what's it? Red ice radio or red ice live or whatever, um, which are big, you know, all right people. Um and they say, well, it's there's nothing wrong with it. It's just promoting your cur- culture and your race. And, and see, these are the other side of, like, Black Lives Matter when I was saying that, you know, they both kept it going. And by doing that, the conversation about police disappeared. And like I said, I'll do a show on that. But they they think that there's some white culture, okay? There is not. There is culture from other countries, but the majority of white people now, if like your grandfather or your parents came from, you know, Ireland or Italy or whatever, came from a specific country and you want to celebrate that country's culture, fine to say you want to celebrate white culture. um, There is no such thing. And with black people, it's different because they they don't know, at least the people that were brought over as slaves, what 
country they originally came from and what their culture was and it it's that's where it is different now that doesn't mean that it's okay because of that it's okay for them to be fucked up towards white people now just because they're white or anything like that but there is a difference in you know culturally um the same with hispanic people that they have um either came from another country or their parents or their parents parents and they want to celebrate the culture of that country and that's fine for anybody but to talk about well white culture and most of these people that are talking about it they don't even know what fucking country they came from and they say european european culture well european culture is not all one fucking culture and it's not all one thing and they say well it's the culture of um the western culture really well germany uh i wouldn't consider all the things that they did uh western culture or russia or even some of these countries that are very socialist right now um france and a lot of Europe is actually socialist. So it, it's just a bunch of bullshit. Uh, sorry, I got into a long conversation just based on my main point that it actually helped him. And I think that's part of why he did it to an extent. But at the same time, he's just a fucking racist. And what bothers me, it's kind of scary, is that you have a, a, I mean, he doesn't do that well maybe he gets a couple thousand listeners to each show and that's pretty good i I mean the best i've ever done i got a thousand something to one show and you know i'd be happy with a couple thousand listeners you know that would be great and he gets people to donate to him i mean that's how he makes his fucking living so i mean if he can do that then you know all power to him but it's scary that people actually support these ideas and i think the reason they do and again i'll do a show about this so i don't want to get too much into it is the whole thing where with government media and how they portrayed everything that was going on with black lives matter and the police and then you had this other side that kind of uh i guess backlash and went extreme and it just the whole fucking thing is just fucked up but well again we'll have to do a show on that what kind of country throws someone in a cage for publicly criticizing the religion of islam saudi arabia ah freedom of speech one of them hesitate at nothing to destroy someone's life culturally for saying the wrong thing i know a lot of people don't like to acknowledge the spectrum of left versus right but at a certain point you do have to look at this you do have to look at the first amendment and say okay who am i linking arms with i get it political platforms change but today which side of the political spectrum is always trying to ban speech which side of the political spectrum is always trying to create a new acronym for fear of you losing your all right i i I can't stop fucking commenting on this because both political parties regardless of what people say have the same goal and that's more power more control more money and to rule over people and they have different ways of approaches of doing it but they're all the fucking same so if you want to talk about the actual political parties it's bullshit and they created the political parties the way they did for a fucking reason they don't make sense they don't go together it's like you don't have it they contradict their beliefs and they did that on purpose because neither of them is for freedom one of them is supposedly for freedom in one area and the other one is for freedom in another area and it it's like it makes no fucking sense but it makes perfect sense when you want to create political parties that no matter which one is in power they're going to fuck they're going to fuck you 
and they're going to try to get as much power and control as possible for the government. Job. Which side of the political spectrum is always trying to ban people from campus, from universities, from media, from television? Which side of the political spectrum is always demanding safe spaces? Occidental College in California is considering instituting a system for students to report so-called microaggressions perpetrated against them on campus. Microaggressions are statements that intentionally or unintentionally send a negative message related to someone's membership in a marginalized group. We visited campus to ask Occidental students if they agree that the following statements could be considered microaggressions. They've all been documented as such on a college campus somewhere in the United States. Have you heard of the term microaggression? Yeah, that's a big thing on campus. If we see large-scale violence, we can name that as a macroaggression. But the way that we devalue that violence, the way that we silence that violence, that's a microaggression. I'm asking an Asian American, where were you born? Yes. Very, very contextual, you know. That's not a microaggression. That's just asking where they were poor. Telling a black student that he or she is very articulate. That is, yeah. Yes. What about saying all lives matter? Um, I think because the history behind Black Lives Matter, it's kind of like um, appropriating a statement that was created specifically to talk about um, black lives being lost to police brutality. So that is... I'm colorblind. I don't see race. Um... Possibly. <laughs> I believe the most qualified person should get the job. Qualifications aren't really the only the only thing you should consider when hiring someone. If you're saying that the most qualified person is someone who is not a minority, you're not of a religion you believe in, then yes, that'd be a microaggression. Qualifications aren't the only thing. Now, I believe that if you're just saying that looking at a resume and not meeting them and their personality because their personality is part of their qualifications. The way they interact or act towards you or how friendly they are. All of those are qualifications for any job. So if you're referring to qualifications as just a resume, then okay, fine, I agree. Because you're not factoring in all of the qualifications. Because if you have two resumes in front of you and somebody is a little bit more qualified based on their resume, but you meet them and one is easier to get along with, they are more outgoing, they are more customer service oriented, which matters no matter whether you deal with the public or not because like for me I don't deal with the public but I have internal customers not as many as I used to right now unfortunately which kind of bothers me but that's all another issue but you haven't you always have internal customers if you don't have an external customers I can't think of a job where you don't I mean I guess it's possible but I don't know whatever every job I've had um at least in since I graduated from college I didn't deal with the public because I've been in an office but I've always had internal customers that Everything I did, not everything, but at least some of the stuff I did directly affected another person or I was doing something for another person. Depending on the task or the job, I had more in some jobs than others. Like one of the things that I've done in my life is write reports from using business intelligence software. So essentially taking data from whatever the system is that we use to record data and then creating reports that people use to look at various different uh, metrics, whether, you know, say like revenue, for example. So 
all those people would be internal customers. So based on that, all of those things about your personality are part of your qualifications. So if you're hiring people that are less qualified when you factor in the whole picture, including their, you know, their personality aspects and getting along with others and all of that stuff, then that is fucked up. Because usually that happens when you know somebody or you have a, or nepotism or whatever, um, you're getting hooked up basically. But I think their answer was, no, you should make sure that your company is diverse just for the sake of diversity. Now, I think it's good for companies to be diverse, but not just for the sake of diversity. So it all depends on what he meant. If he just meant looking at a resume and your qualifications based on that, I don't think you can just go, uh, you can just base hiring somebody on that alone because there's other factors that come into it and there's things that you can learn that maybe you're the type of person that can show that you've learned things easily in the past so saying god bless you after somebody sneezes oh that would be a microaggression because of different religions yeah it could that's kind of fucked up i say bless you I actually don't say God bless you. I say bless you. And I don't believe in religion. And that all came from because people thought the devil, you were in a vulnerable position and the devil would crawl up your nose. I'm serious. That's supposedly where it came from. Be a microaggression to someone who doesn't believe in God. I think that the harm there is relatively minimal. So... There's still some harm, though. Uh, I would say there's not harm, but if it's being asked, clearly someone found Maybe mini microaggression. Perhaps. Do you see any downside to creating a database full of statements that faculty and students make to each other in terms of protecting free speech values on campus? Not in terms of protecting free speech value, but the idea of a database certainly raises eyebrows so yes we do need a system where we can report our experiences and that like a system of um, education or whatever i would say it's good to have it in place but to have like harsh accents against it it wouldn't be beneficial to student life here. it'll make a safer environment so i fully this is really fucked up and i'm going to talk about this after uh I'll just play the rest of this and shut up. But this is really fucked up because supposedly, you know, the the children are our future and all that bullshit. Um, and I guess in reality they are because they would be the ones that are going to be voting and stuff like that. Hopefully uh, voting totally goes away and we don't have a government at some point. But no matter what, they're going to be the ones that are living um, and um, in positions of power, whether it's at a company um, and things like that. So if you have this generation that is going to college right now, that if this is the majority's opinion and I hope it's not. I mean, these are just, you know, talking to certain college students. I don't know how this was edited, what not. But that's very scary because they're doing, it's like the government has succeeded, like I said earlier about the government getting people to defend 
the government when someone says something anti-government, that they don't need the government to do it because people will do it. Same kind of thing. These people are defending like being spied on or having all their data in a database being collected. We support the council, and I think it's really great that the faculty is taking this initiative um, because it wasn't one of the demands. The faculty on their own said, like, we're going to do this because we believe it's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, so they went I, above and beyond to police hate speech. I think so in some respects. Black, 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 black. Protests are erupting on college campuses across the country as students demand that administrators address racial grievances through mandatory sensitivity training courses, hiring of more diverse faculty members, and the resignation of insufficiently responsive college presidents. Change comes from listening, learning, caring. Video captured at Yale University show a student shouting down a professor trying to engage her in conversation about the role of faculty in regulating students' Halloween costumes. It is not about creating an intellectual thing. It is not. This professor's wife, also a faculty member, later resigned from Yale, saying, The current climate at Yale is not, in my view, conducive to civil dialogue and open inquiry. Another clip out of the University of Missouri shows students and at least one professor pushing journalists out of their self-styled safe space. You're pushing me. You need to get out. You need to get out. While these protesters are clearly exercising their First Amendment rights, images such as these have led more and more observers to wonder whether or not college students care about the free speech rights of others. What are your thoughts on the concept of free speech? Do you support free speech? Yes, I do support free speech. Um, and Oxy is an environment that also supports differing opinions. Free speech allows you to have new input constantly. And I think that's like a really big part of um, the community here at Oxy. Obama or Oxy, uh, as Oxy encouraged this, saying that instead of college students being coddled, they should have these active discussions so that they can learn something new and um, change their viewpoints a little bit. Too much censor censorship would give a lot of power to few individuals, and I believe in a more even distribution of power. I think that everyone should be able to say um, what they believe and what's on their mind. Most of the students we spoke with seem to defend free speech in principle, if not always in practice. But one organizer of the previous week's protests viewed even the concept of free speech with deep suspicion. Those using the rhetoric of free speech are um, individuals who already are in positions of power who are creating history, who are creating these dominant narratives. Free speech conceptually is about this idea of equality that everyone can have the right to say something, but that's not the way our society works. That's not the way this college campuses work. We only hear the same reiteration of particular voices over and over again, and that's white students' voices. That's President Veach's voice. A recent Pew poll found that 95% of Americans believe citizens should have the right to criticize government policies publicly. But the numbers weaken when you start talking about offensive speech. 40% of millennials polled believe that the government should be able to prevent people from making statements that are offensive to minority groups, for instance. If it's a racist remark or something that tries to stir up the public, I think that is that should be stopped. I think if the speech involves a threat or um, involves violence of any type, then that should not be allowed. But other than that, I don't think there should be a, like a regulation on that. Personally, I think that if you ever say someone, you know, I hate you because you're so-and-so, that's a, you know, that should not be allowed. In a way, it's free speech, but in a way, again, it's a hate crime. If you're saying you're a lesser person because you're Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Catholic, any of the above, that's not okay, and that's a hate crime. That's the other thing about free speech when I say that it's about power and privilege. It only enables, um, like, things like hate speech because it makes it seem that like everything that we say has equal weight when that's that's not true don't want to single out uh, donald trump but his approach to this political campaign like saying we should monitor some mosques we should build this wall and keep out all the mexicans because they bring their gangs they bring all their crime that kind of speech is really hurtful to those people mm -hmm. For no reason, just because he wants to get his uh, views across. And but really Donald Trump able. shouldn't be allowed to say those things. Personally, I wouldn't say so just because, like a lot of other people, I don't really think that he has the capabilities of being a president. What kind of repercussions would you like to see for uh, hate speech violations? No, I haven't really thought about that, to be honest. Um, I think that in no way should we like send someone to prison for that. Um, but I think that there should be protection of people who are being attacked. 
what we say in terms of hate speech has incredible weight, right? Because it's intimately linked to violence against people of color. It's intimately linked to the prison industrial complex. Do you think free speech is valued on this campus? Yeah, I think it is. You feel that free speech is alive and well on the campus of Occident? Yes. The only thing that I do know now is that you're in, we're in a position where you can't ignore what's going on on this campus. And that's kind of the bottom line. So students have been turning a blind eye for a while now. Um, whether, it's, whether or not they're using a justification of free, free speech, um, that's on them. Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in. Username, Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And that was fucking nuts. And... I've heard shit like that all the time where uh, videos and stuff like that where college students are saying really ignorant fucking shit. Now, does that mean that that represents the majority of millennials or college students? I, it's, I, I don't think so. But it may be a significant portion of them. It, it seems like, and it it's hard for me to tell because obviously I'm not on a college campus. I don't believe anything I hear in government media. And I'm not even sure. So I was talking earlier about YouTube and how you have all these uh what I call celebrity YouTubers similar to like celebritarians. And that's the type of stuff that they talk about. And you have some people that are on one side, like the side that most of those people were on the, they'll call them social justice warriors. And then you have a bunch of people that are on the other side. But it seems like you only have those two sides. And that, that that was one of my issues that I don't see anybody really talking about true freedom and any of the stuff that I'm talking about or covering or, or whatever. Now, I'll cover some of the stuff that they do like this because this is insane. And something like speech, the whole thing is, though, they don't cover the root problem behind it or the the motivation behind it and they probably because they don't believe in what I do as far as which I think is obvious if you look at all these things that are going on like militarization of police all the spying whatever there's so many different things um and you also have with the whole freedom of speech and hate crime and hate speech and all of that. So they're essentially saying that speech, hate speech, um, some of them, that it is a crime. Now, first of all, it's very subjective. What is hate speech? You can interpret anybody can interpret it any way they want. They could say this is in in he had asked specific questions like is this microaggression and it was ridiculous. Essentially and, and it, it, there was a girl who said something about by using um like racial remarks or something that I don't know what the fuck she was saying. It made no sense. She mentioned the prison industrial complex and whatever. And obviously she doesn't know what that is because she's comparing that to somebody talking about hate speech. Now, essentially, I believe that people can say whatever the fuck they want to say. And they have that right. Now, it goes back to self-ownership. And the non-aggression principle, which I don't really use that word. I just, 
use more, you know, as long as you don't bother anybody. Um, you have the right to do whatever you want. So, but do you have the right to say whatever you want to somebody? Technically, yes. And is is that aggression? It It's hard to say whether it's aggression or not, depending on what you're saying. If you're going over and threatening somebody and say, I'm going to fuck you up if you do this, that's more of a threat. Although I think you have the right to say whatever you want. Now, I... I don't know whether I'd say that's, I mean, I guess that would be aggression. You're threatening somebody, you're fucking with them. And if there's a reason behind it, if they did something to you, then I guess that's, there's another um, aspect to that because you're not just doing it to do it. But, at the same time, I mean, you have the right to say whatever you want. I'm sorry, even if it's if people think it's hateful or people think it's racist or whatever. Now, I don't agree with people saying certain things, but it's not a crime and it's not something, you know, to call that a hate crime because you call somebody something. And I've known people who have used, um, I guess, racist words who I would not even consider racist. They did it because the specific person that they had issues with happened to be of a certain race and they were trying to piss them off. But they didn't hate all people of that race or have anything against all people of that race, just that one person. Um, the example I always like to use is that if somebody's gay and you have a problem with a gay person and you call them a fag, I, I'm not saying that that's okay, but the rationale in this situation that I'm giving is that the person doesn't have a problem with all gay people. They just have a problem with that one person, not because they're gay, just because they have a problem with them. And because they also happen to be gay, it's like going after whatever. If you're in an argument with somebody and they're a drug addict, then you'd say, fuck you, you're a drug addict, you're a loser, you're whatever. You're going to think of all these things to say that's going to piss them off. I'm not saying saying they're, they're gay is the same thing, but it's the same rationale as you're trying to fucking piss them off. And it's the same thing no matter if it's race or religion or whatever that that doesn't make you hate that group or mean that you're discriminatory against a certain group or racist. But that's what you'll be called. So this whole thing, and I've been on college campuses when I was in college. Now, I was kind of withdrawn because... I went to community college for two years. We didn't live, we didn't live at school. I mean, they didn't have, I didn't live at school. They didn't have uh, dorms there. Although I had a lot of friends there and I talked to them, but there it wasn't like a typical college atmosphere. It was more like high school um, because nobody lived there. And when I went to, I transferred to a four-year school and I worked full-time while I was going to school. So I really didn't hang out there and I didn't live there neither. And I didn't hang out there or make a lot of friends. I mean, I was friends with a few people uh, during school and, you know, I didn't hang out with them outside of school. Maybe actually one person I did. Um, 
but I was more when I say withdrawn, I don't mean like uh what you would think. I just mean I was more like really didn't have time to get into this social aspect of what's going on on campus. Plus campus was so fucking separated. It was in downtown Boston, Emerson College. So you had buildings. It wasn't like one big campus all together. You had buildings like all over Boston. I mean, you had like one building a mile away from another building, literally. So it was a different type of atmosphere. But at the same time, you know, I didn't live there neither. I didn't get really involved in the school. And it was a small private school that was, uh, it was a communication school. It was actually a pretty good, you know, I mean, it's not USC or something, uh, or UCLA, but it was, it was a relatively good communication school for what it was. It it was, it was pretty good. So I can't really speak to has this changed a lot and now we're hearing more about it because of the internet and back then well they they had the internet back then but there wasn't youtube but because of things like youtube or have things really changed that much and is it you know, people are looking to prove a point. So they're looking for these type of people. And I'm not saying that they don't exist because they do. Um, There's movements that they focus on these things like hate speech. And they actually want it to be a criminal charge. Certain speech. So who determines what's hate speech and what's not? How would you even do that, first of all? And they've done it, I guess, in England. And the rationale behind it for politicians, because it's something that they want. And, of course, that's why government media promotes it and they promote political correctness and all of this shit. Because it's about control. It's about not being able to say what the fuck you want to say. It has nothing to do with hate. It has nothing to do with fucking what you're saying. It has to do with being able to control people's speech. And a lot of people don't know or forget that throughout the history of the country, there's never really been free speech. There's been a certain amount of free speech. But people don't remember two live crew being arrested for performing. Um, Someone being arrested in Miami for selling their album. NWA, uh, being arrested for performing fuck the police uh ice t and cop killer uh pressure being put on them and probably threats by the government for time warner to stop uh selling the album and it wasn't even actually rap it was a he did a heavy metal album he kind of i guess rapped on it sort of but he was rapping over heavy metal. So it was more of a heavy metal album, but all of these things have gone on. So it's not like all of a sudden, plus you had Tipper Gore going after mainly rap music to put parental advisory stickers on albums, Al Gore's wife, So this uh, hate speech is really just what I get from these kids 
is it's like they're too fucking sensitive and i'm a very sensitive person don't get me wrong but that's not that kind of sensitive you know and i don't even know that that's you know most of the things that are going on what i've seen is not even direct and i mean that in the sense of and maybe college kids are a lot more immature so they're acting like fucking high school kids But I didn't see that in college. I saw, you know, I loved college again. I didn't live there, so I wasn't in the, you know, always around the school. And like I said, my last year and a half, I I worked full time. So I just go to class and and that was about it. But I, I liked college and I hated high school. So... People were more mature in college, at least when I went. Now, I don't know if they're, if kids are being brought up where there's a lack of maturity and they talk about kids not, you know, millennials not being tough enough or not being able to take care of themselves or not, you know, being too sensitive. And again, like I said, I mean, I'm sensitive in different ways. But I think a lot of the stuff that's going on is not shit that is directed at them. It's stuff that's more like political, like somebody comes there to speak and they're like, what they're saying is offensive or um, people do a protest and their protest is offensive as opposed to somebody walking right up to someone and saying something offensive, you know. If you're offended, then you're fucking offended. I mean, you can't ban everything. And, you know, people have the right to be offended, but people have the right to say what the fuck they want to say. If you don't like a speaker that's on campus, don't go there. People have a right to protest. It's just like, why are you wasting all your time with this bullshit? Fucking, if you're going to go to college, for one, if you're going to spend all that money fucking learn some shit even though you know most colleges are more biased and 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 teach a progressive kind of agenda and at the same time you know there are so much more important things and we're, we're sitting here or at least they are And this is what's going on on YouTube, these battles back and forth about a lot of meaningless fucking shit. Now, when you talk about trying to make getting the government involved in something, to me, that is not meaningless. When you try to get the government involved in taking rights away, that is not meaningless. So with hate speech... I've seen this for a while and this is where the same way we talked about thought crimes. It's the same thing where it's being monitored. Your data is being collected and they have, you know, charged people with crimes for speech on Facebook and it being interpreted as hate speech or threatening hate speech. And some of the things that were said were ridiculous that they were charged with any fucking crime. So to me, it's important to talk about the fact that free speech, like every other freedom, is under attack just as much as gun rights or well that's probably a little more but you know all these other things what's happening is people i've talked about this before the difference between positive and negative rights and the difference for people who haven't heard me say this before is that positive rights are what they're trying to teach people now 
that you have positive rights, meaning you're entitled to certain things, whether it's health care, which means you're entitled to somebody's labor or you're entitled to a job that pays a certain amount of money or you're entitled to all these things that the government has to enforce by threat of violence. Now, negative rights or rights that you're born with that really, for the most part, don't involve anybody else. Because you're not entitled to anybody else's labor or anybody else's anything. They involve your rights to do what you want and live your life as long as you don't directly interfere with somebody else living their life. And directly within that statement means a lot. So I had brought up before that they believe, they being the people that believe in these positive rights, that they have the freedom to not be killed, which means that people don't have a right to own a gun. Because if you own a gun, there's a possibility that you could kill them somehow. I mean, the whole concept is ridiculous. So their right, and I just heard somebody say this like the other day. They believe that their right to live, which you don't have a fucking right to live. You, you in a sense, don't. And that sounds kind of fucked up and contradictive of negative rights. I mean, you have a right to live your life, but you don't have a right. I guess to I'm trying to think of how to explain this. You don't have a right to live in the sense of other people's freedoms being violated to make sure that you stay alive. Now you have a right to be alive and live your life. But they try to manipulate and twist things to say, well, your right to being alive is affected by other people's right to own guns or then it should be to drive cars and all of these other things. And people will say they have a right to health care, which means they're saying that their right to receive something from somebody else, one, is a right and it's not, but they have a right to somebody else's labor for free or regardless. They do not have a right to somebody else's labor Unless that person who owns themselves says, you know, yeah, I'll give you care or I'll give you care for free or I won't give you care. But you don't have a right to somebody else's body or their labor in any sense unless they agree to that. But these fuckers are starting to twist the meaning of freedom into positive freedoms. You have the right to a, what do they say? That they have a right to a living wage. Based off of what? What rationale gives you that right? Now, I don't want to get into a whole big thing about this because we have limited time and I want to make sure uh, we discuss the rest of uh, what I wanted to talk about. But I can't say that enough 
about positive and negative rights. Because positive rights are not rights. They are nothing. They are people that they are entitlements, not rights. The right to be free to do what you want, the right to put what you want in your own body, the right to travel, all of these things and more are rights that you are born with at a human as a human being and they're not contingent upon somebody else losing their right for you to have your right so for example if you choose you choose what to put in your body is not contingent upon what somebody else does. Meaning that you don't need anybody else to do anything for you to put something in your body. And if it's something that's not available, you don't have a right for that, for somebody to go and make sure that you have that. You only have a right to put in your body what you can get a hold of, meaning that, you know, nobody owes you anything. This whole culture of people owing you, and it's all part of this whole big fucking, this bigger thing that I don't know how people can't see it. Because this part of it is very relevant. And it all fits in with everything else. So you have the spying and the databases, and this is all part of it because as they advance technology, they're going to be able to have computers that check more stuff and analyze more of your posts, more of your information. They're going to move towards hate speech. Or saying that your speech incites violence. Or that it incites whatever. And they have that law, you know, inciting a riot because of what you say. They're already doing it now subliminally with hate speech. So, or hate crimes. Because hate speech are going to become hate crimes, so it's very relevant. But I'm not a fan of him. I can't fucking stand him. He's an arrogant prick. But they've they've done it with Donald Trump. They, being the government media, has said on multiple occasions that because of what Trump has said, And to be honest, I watched all of the, not watched them, but listened to them because again, you know, something to listen to and I wanted to to hear what they were saying. Listen to all the Republican and Democrat debates, listen to the Hillary Trump debates, heard a lot of shit that he said, um, there's not a lot. Now, I wouldn't say nothing he said was derogatory. I'm with, I think, the guy who said there's no such thing as hate speech, first of all. I don't think that you can, unless you can define something clearly... You can't say that just like assault weapons, but I guess they can define them clearly, but they, they everybody defines them differently. Um, in a bill, they can define them clearly, but that's about it. But hate speech doesn't really exist because it's a matter of opinion what is hateful and what is not, and what is a joke and what is not. You can have a consensus 
to say that, well, the majority of people we asked, is this hateful, hateful? So with, with Trump, the only, first of all, stuff that I thought that was discriminatory or I don't know that I call it racist, but, you know, again, because that word is thrown around, but he said shit about immigrants, specifically Mexicans, and he said some derogatory shit. He did. And that's fucked up. Now, is that a crime? No. He said some stuff that was disrespectful to women. I believe most of that was not publicly, but privately, and it got on tape. And I don't know every fucking thing he said. But as far as him being racist against black people, I didn't hear anything that he said about black people. The only thing that I saw the media doing was saying that he didn't denounce David Duke fast enough or something. And that the Ku Klux Klan supposedly supported him. The 10 guys in their basement in Louisiana or something. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan is a fucking joke. I don't know how many members they have, but not a lot. They are not like the Ku Klux Klan used to be. They're not even close. They're a bunch of losers in their mother's fucking basement. And again, I'm not even trying to defend him because I think he's a douchebag. And I think what he said about Mexicans and immigrants and some of the stuff he said about women. And I'm saying publicly because the shit he said privately, it's unfair to really judge him on that as far as, I mean, as a person, it's fair to judge him on that, but his campaign on that. But, What they did was they said, now, this is what government media is saying, that he created a climate where it's okay to discriminate and be racist and all of these things. So, like, he created a, like, the alt-right likes him, whatever. But he is not you know, alt-right, as far as I know. He's not a white nationalist, and he's not a white supremacist, as far as I know. I mean, maybe he secretly is. But I fucking doubt it, because before... See, the the thing that people forget is that we have a whole history of fucking Trump before he ran for president. He was a celebrity, a celebrity businessman. But, and yes, he was... I would say he's a was always a misogynist. He fucking married women based on their looks. And they married him based on his money, most likely. I mean, look at him. Who's fucking marrying him? And he was an arrogant fucking, you know, thinks everybody loves him and he's better than everybody else and all this shit. And as far as him being racist, there was the thing where he had buildings that supposedly um, in the 70s, something where black people weren't allowed to live or got kicked out or something like that. I, I don't know if that was from his father and there were buildings that he gave him uh, or not. But I don't think that Donald Trump is racist against black people. I'm sorry. And. I'd be the first person to say it because I can't stand the motherfucker. But I just don't. I mean, he was always trying to be friends with black celebrities. He was even on Method Man's album in 1994. Now, that doesn't mean that he's not racist just because he has black friends. I know. But there's really no evidence 
to show that he's racist against black people. Now he, the shit he said about immigrants and Mexicans specifically. Yes. And some of the stuff with women. Yes. And he was always, you know, I think a, a misogynist anyway. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, he has a track record of his whole life that he's been in the public eye and he su- supported, you know, the Clintons before and he supported all these liberal policies before. So, you know, now all of a sudden he's a fucking, you know, how he is now. I mean, it's basically with Trump, you're going to get the same thing you would have got with Hillary. It was rigged. But. It's even smarter to do it that way because now people aren't going to see it's coming. They think, oh, Trump's great and they're all supportive and all the people that were anti-Obama are now pro-Trump and, you know, all of this shit. And so they do that every fucking time. It's like when Bush uh, left office, you know, people, KRS-One had said this, like people on the verge of revolution. You know, and then they put in Obama and everyone was like, oh, that's great. Now we have Obama. He's going to fight for us. He's about change and he's black and whatever. And it's you got the same shit. And it's the same thing with Trump. But my main point was what they're doing that relates to what I'm talking about is that they're putting blame on. And saying that, oh, because Donald Trump did all this stuff and got away with it, saying that he went around saying racist and uh, in politically or unpolitically correct things um, in all of this, that he caused other people to do the same thing. And that's why they're doing it. It's pretty fucked up. It's like subliminally he did this. So now all these people are following, you know, blaming. And I'm not saying that he didn't do the things they say. A lot of them he did. Some of them he didn't. But to blame, put the blame on him for people taking their own actions is ridiculous. But I think they're saying more about like people being racist and stuff like that. That they're saying, well, Trump came out and he was racist. And now um, all these other people are doing the same thing because they saw it was OK or, or something. I, I don't know. The whole thing is just fucking ridiculous. So it's. The same thing in that, you know, whether you want to call it hate speech or a hate crime or a thought crime or whatever. Because that's what the government wants it to be. They want speech to be limited as much as possible because they want to control as much as they can. So if there's a way to to get hate speech laws passed like they have in other countries. That's what they're going to do. And then when the technology gets better, or they might even have the technology now, you'll be fucking charged with crimes for, and people have already, but more and more people will be charged with crimes for what they post on Facebook. So the other thing related to hate crimes are actual crimes that take place that then they add hate crime to it. So if it's a beating or a murder or 
whatever it might be. Usually it will involve violence because it's a personal crime against that person because of their race is what they're saying. But how, first of all, I I don't believe that there should be hate crimes, period. And the rationale behind that is that it's the same thing as a thought crime. It's saying that you're assuming that you know what this person was thinking and what their motives and thoughts were. Now, in the 1960s, it made sense. And one of the reasons behind it, at least that they gave, was that you had things going on like in Mississippi burning where the states would let people off. Now, I don't know how... See, this is the other thing, though. I don't know how how often that happened. They want you to think it happened all the time so you would support hate crime laws. But I don't know how often that happened. But it made sense that... If people got off from the state, that the federal government could go after them on a civil rights violation like they did because Mississippi burning was based on a true story like they did in Mississippi burning where they murdered the three civil rights workers. The state, of course, isn't going to go after them for murder, but the federal government could go after them for civil rights violations because of the hate crime. Actually, I don't even know if that's because of the hate crime law. That might be because of, I mean, it's related, but because of the Civil Rights Amendment. I'm not sure. But as far as hate crimes in general, and there are a lot of hate crimes that are committed by black people against white people as well. If you... Um, I actually read the book White Girl Bleed a lot, and it's it's documented a lot of them, and it seems to point towards being racially motivated, but there are very few that are charged as hate crimes. However, I don't think there should be anything that is charged as a hate crime. Because, one, I mean, the system is so fucked up anyway. And the judge has latitude where they can sentence the person to a harsher punishment anyway, first of all. And, you know, if you murder somebody, you know, murder is a pretty serious crime. You could put the person in jail for life if that's what the judge sentenced them to. So why do you need an extra thing, a federal offense on top of it? as well you don't and then you're assume you're making assumptions about what the person was thinking now yes if they were beating somebody and you have them on videotape or you have witnesses saying that they called them you know depending on what race the people were you know were calling them derogatory racial names and during that beating But not every crime is as blatant as that. Every time a white person kills a black person that you hear about in government media, and this is for a reason because they're trying to exploit an agenda, right away it's it was a hate crime or it has to be investigated as a hate crime, at least with the police. Now, being that, I'm totally anti-police and they get away with everything, no matter who they murder. Um, It's a little different, but I still don't think hate crime should apply. I think these fuckers should go to jail based on they they're murdering somebody. And if they want to pass a federal law, that any time a cop murders somebody, that there's a federal investigation, 
that has nothing to do with it being a hate crime, but that a, a cop killing somebody is a federal offense, then you do it that way. But no one's going to do nothing about cops now because they fucked it all up and made it all about race. So nobody was is talking about, you know, on, on one side they made it all about race. Well, they made it all about race on both sides, basically. And then the one side just defended the cops because they made it all about race and the cops were white. Well, they're not all white, I guess. And then the other side made it all about race as well. So from that, and like I said, I'm going to do a separate show on that. So I, I don't need to really talk a lot about that. But as far as having a law against hate crimes, it's almost like a pre-crime or a thought crime. Because I think more of a thought crime. Because again, you're assuming you know what that person's motivation was. And any crime where a white person kills a black person, right away, the first thought is, well, it was because they're black. Well, I've been in fights with a lot of people of a lot of races. And I've been in fights with black people. None of the fights with black people had anything to do with the fact that they were black. Just like none of the fights with white people. Well, actually there are fights with white people that had to do with the fact that they were white, I guess, because they had called me, you know, uh, names or whatever like wannabe whatever I used to I've talked about before how I used to hang out with all black kids and they used to uh say racist things so but it wasn't me saying racist stuff in any of the fights I was in if I was in a fight where there were racial aspects to it. It was the other side saying something to me, not the other way around. And I've run into both racist white people, racist black people. And on their side, yeah, it probably was a hate crime against me, actually. But it wasn't on my side. But I don't believe it should be uh charged as a hate crime it should be charged as whatever it is whether it's assault or murder or of course it wasn't murder but you know assault and that has happened by both black and white people that have uh i guess assaulted me because of you know, race being whether it's because they said, oh, you want to be black or whatever, or because I not black. <laughs> so both has happened. One of the other things that I want to talk about with pre-crime and, and we're going to have to end pretty soon is drinking and driving. Or doing any drug for that matter and driving or or even being drinking and fucking walking. I mean, people get arrested for being intoxicated, which should not be a crime. There's so many things that shouldn't be crimes, of course, because the only thing the only things that are real crimes are incidents that have victims. If there's no victim, there's no crime. But drinking and driving in itself, getting arrested for drinking and driving is pre-crime. 
and fucking checkpoints is a means to it's like a pre-crime setup because no one's committed an actual crime now they'd say drinking and driving is a crime well that's a made-up crime because as far as i'm concerned just because government passes a law it doesn't mean shit remember that when laws get passed what is that that's a bunch of politicians that got together and passed a fucking law. That's all it is. And most of the time, they have ulterior motives as to why. So, if you haven't, if you're just driving and you haven't done anything and you're not, um, you're able to drive and you haven't obviously hit anybody or killed anybody or assaulted anybody with your car, then where's the crime? What they're trying to do is stop a crime before it happens, technically. So how is that not pre-crime? It's totally what it is. And they're getting more into that. What about with so-called terrorism? And they're looking at posts and things like that. And they're, in some cases, well, we don't even know, but, you know, charging people, or with potential terrorists, again, I, I don't know what they're doing, but because they probably just disappear them. But they're arresting, they do arrest people for Facebook posts. And I've talked about it on the show, specific incidences of people being arrested for Facebook posts. But, I mean, in summary, this is a very dangerous thing. One, they have a certain amount of people, and a lot of them are millennials, and maybe they'll learn later. But they're collecting all of our data. We already know that. So they have all this information on us. Now, Again, based on computer programs, I think the goal at some point, and they may even be be doing it now, and they'll definitely be able to do it with kids that are born, that go to government schools, that are born um, going forward or were born after a certain year when they started doing this, but they're going to have all your data of your whole life and they're going to be able to analyze that data using uh, computers and what do you call it? Uh, Artificial intelligence and create profiles of people. That's when you get pre-crime. That's when you get this person has a the potential to be a criminal in the future or they even you know Obama put all this money into wanting to study the brain and they want to be able to predict whether people are going to do crimes or not now I don't think it's because they give a fuck about the crime I think it's because control and power that if they can convince people which they will be able to that these things are accurate like in Captain America and it, those of you that have seen the 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 part 2 Winter Soldier where they created 
basically artificial intelligence that identified 20 million people that needed to be killed because they were going to somehow cause some type of problem. Now, that problem could have been that they were going to stand up against the government or they were anti-government or any of that stuff, that they believed in freedom. But that was the whole point, that they wanted to get rid of those people. And you're going to have them using thought crimes, computer analysis of all this data. That's why I keep telling people they're putting the infrastructure in place. That's what they, they've been doing. Now, I don't know how far advanced they are with their artificial intelligence, their alg- algorithms, and their ability to identify people and profile them and to determine what they're going to do. I mean, that's what Google's doing as well. And Google shares their information with the government. They got grants from the government to build robots, DARPA, military robots, of course, because that's the other thing is war. And it's not necessarily for war against um, other countries, It's war possibly against the people here. But they've been putting in all this infrastructure. This is just another part or piece of the puzzle. Speech. Free speech. That the government doesn't want people speaking out. They don't want people, especially that are quote-unquote anti-government or think for themselves or challenge the government or speak out about the government or talk about what the government's real plans are. As long as, I guess if people don't listen to them, then who gives a fuck? But the chance that somebody might, You know, that's why I said somebody like me, you know, am I, am I a threat to the government? Not really. I don't have enough people that listen to me. If I did, then yeah, because the truth is on my side that this, and, and I will revisit this again because I didn't get to, um, it was kind of a last minute thing and I was unsure what I was going to do today show wise and and even if I was going to do a show actually but when um, it comes down to it thought crime pre-crime and hate speech are all ways to control people and to use them as precursors to go after people and to take more control and to get rid of them, whether it's camps or kill them or whatever. Because the government's most important thing, continuity of government, no matter what, the government goes on and continues to go on and at that same time continues to take as much power as possible. So that's about all the time we have for tonight. Um, Again, I wish I could have gone through uh, more detail in this and gone more into it, but this will definitely come up again. Um, And I'll definitely do some more um, research on it and maybe I'll do a, you know, YouTube video, a short one, but where I just, you know, focus on the important parts
because this, I think, along with a whole bunch of other things, is all part of the big plan. This, I don't think, is as important in that, I mean, it is important, but in their priorities, it's not number one. I think one of the most important things, of course, is guns and parenting. Parenting meaning that you get to, you're able to control the parents to bring up their kids to worship government or at least get them to, you know, get their kids in the government schools and not contradict what they're being taught there while they're being indoctrinated and then while you're collecting all the data on them. And then at some point, I'll do a show that puts it all together or even maybe a short YouTube video. So this is a lot more important than I think I made this out to be. And I apologize for that. But again, this is not about fucking kids in college that are just fucking too sensitive and ignorant. They're dangerous because the more people that buy into this bullshit, you know, even one girl wanted the speech, their speech put into a database. And that's crazy. They don't understand a lot of people. I would say the majority of people. Now, there's a lot of people that do. But the ramifications of all this data collection, because this is one of them, and whether there was data collection or not, I mean, this would still be going on, and it's still something that is important. But the data collection makes it even more important because that's how you get all the information about thought crimes and pre-crimes and hate speech, which will become hate crimes. So... But that's all we have for tonight. I kind of even went longer than I had planned to go, which is why I had moved the show, for those who don't know, to 6 o'clock. So every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we start at 6 o'clock now. And I had planned to just go two hours, but usually I go at least three now. So, um, And that was happening before when I did the show at 7 and cut it to two hours. I usually would never go two hours, so at least I'm not uh, going too long because I do need to get some sleep since I get up at quarter of six every morning. So I really appreciate everybody that tunes in and, you know, please, any comments that you have or even any ideas for shows or information or, you know, I'm always looking for people that want to help and want to contribute. And I don't make any money off this. So, you know, I can't give anybody any money. But if it's something that you believe in and want to help with the show, uh, I'm always looking for help in all aspects. So I'd appreciate anybody who wants to help or in If you have any critiques for me, you know, not you suck, you whatever. I mean, you can you could say that and I really don't give a fuck, but that's not going to help to get the show, uh, make the show better or to improve things. And that's uh, one of the things I want to do. So thanks, everybody, again for tuning in and we'll be back on Tuesday. 
So have a good night. He will defend these police officers.